Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying PlatformCon. I am here today to talk about building the IDE Golden Path, what exactly that means, and some case studies and best practices around it. So a little bit about me, I am Ben. I've spent the last six years working for various dev tools companies, um, the last three and a half at Coder.com. And I'm at Coder because I really like dev environments. One of my favorite dev environments was a Raspberry Pi that I had running in my university dorm room that I could then connect to from any machine running on the campus network. So from a lab machine, I was able to connect to it, do all my dev work. And at the end of class, I didn't have to upload any files to Google Drive. I could just pick up where I left off on an iPad or even a, a Chromebook through a web IDE. Um, today, I'm in Austin, Texas. That's also where the coder headquarters are. So if you happen to be in Austin and want to meet up and talk about cloud dev environments or um, platform engineering, hit me up. If you're not in Austin and still want to talk about it, um, hit me up too. We can totally connect virtually. Uh, but what I'm here to talk about today is that there's a gap in most developer platforms. I'm not necessarily saying you need to fill this gap. We'll get into that in the next slide. Um, but I do want to talk about where um, platforms typically do really well and where they fall short. So uh, a typical platform, a developer can go in, um, pick an app template, and get a bunch of stuff stood up for them that um, otherwise they would have to do manually. They can come, it comes with CI, CD in many cases, test infrastructure, observability, um, as well as some staging and production environments. And a lot of platform engineering has like security built in as well. So this is, this is awesome, but, but there's a missing kind of step involved for developers really to interact with these things, which uh, I like to call the developers inner loop which is essentially the developer working on their machine, um, doing software development, testing their work um, with, with an editor. So it's, it's the actual art of programming. Um, and this is where developers spend the majority of their time. So what this workflow looks like coming from a platform is a developer will clone their work. Um, they'll run like a, a git clone. They'll set up um, a, a bunch of their tools, so Docker, maybe Python, Spring, Java, uh, and then they'll start coding on, on an editor. But there's a lot of different choices here, and um, th this path isn't always uh, fantastic. From there, uh, the developer will then commit, and then everything is being handled and automated by the, the platform. So platform engineering does a great job kind of automating away the things that aren't part of the developer's inner loop. But um, th there there is an opportunity to to kind of automate away the 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 dev environment itself. Uh, and that really goes into who is this talk for? Um, it, it's really for platform engineers and, and developer experience engineers who, who are struggling with one or two problems in this kind of developer environment um, area. Uh, the, the first is maybe your organization already has standardized dev environments, but it, it's through a, a legacy platform such as VDI. Um, VDI is really good at certain things. For example, it can pre-install tools um, based on a, a user's profile, so it can handle the, the automated install of tools. Um, it's also really good for security. Uh, if, if you work at a regulated, um, in, in a regulated industry or for a regulated um, organization, the VDI can do things like prevent source code from being downloaded or audit copy-paste. Um, there's, there's kind of important security features. Um, where, where VDI falls short, especially in the concepts uh, uh, of in, around platform engineering and, and DevOps, is uh, first and foremost the, the operating system. Um, most likely, you're, you're building a platform around Linux, whether that's that's Kubernetes or Docker containers, um, and, and, and the environment where developers are actually writing the code is, is Windows. Now, th there's there's plenty of ways to to work around that. Um, you can run Docker Desktop. You can um, run WSL. There, there, there is a Linux path um, for development, but at that point, you're several layers of virtualization down, and and that's really not what what VDI is is built for. Um, I have a screenshot of Task Manager here with with 100% disk, and, and this is intentional. Um, something that that I hear a lot is that the the disk usage particularly is is not really optimized for um, software development. So if someone's doing a, a Git clone or or an npm install, the disk is one of the first things to kind of fall over. Um, another issue with with these kind of virtual desktops is, is they're just kind of laggy, um, it, especially when you're not on a perfect network. Um, when when you're typing or maybe dragging screens around, it's 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 not the same as having the <laughs> like a, like a, a, a an actual like desktop application. 
Um, the, the second problem you might be facing is actually kind of the opposite, which is you haven't standardized and you're supporting a wide variety of, of hardware and, and editors and, and plugins and, and languages. And it, it can get really complicated really quickly. Um, something that, that I heard a lot, especially a couple of years ago, was the transition from Intel MacBooks to M1 MacBooks was particularly um, painful to support. Uh, another one is, is, is contractor. Um, machines and, and giving them like access, not only to um, like the tools they need, but but network access as well, which is which is necessary for this inner loop development, which is source control databases, um, Kubernetes clusters, really anything that goes into into development. Uh, another thing that I think is, is getting more difficult to manage and, and kind of regulate is the use of specific IDE plugins such as such as Copilot um, uh, or, or really just any developer tools. Um, it, it's very difficult to standardize and really make a good golden path when you're supporting such a matrix of um, uh, of images. So this isn't only harmful for the, the IT um, and, and platform team, but it's also harmful for the developer as well because there's, there's not really a clear way to optimize a, a specific path for developers because you're kind of forced at, at supporting so many different pieces of, of hardware and, and um, like matrices of, of configuration for these for these dev environments. Um, and, and this is like a really difficult problem. And uh, fortunately, there's a frame of thinking that can really help, which is which is platform engineering. Um, and if if you kind of have these these problems, I, I really would encourage you to start thinking about um, the, the IDEs in the developer um, environments as, as a product or even as a feature inside your internal developer platform. Now, there's a, a lot of talks here um, at PlatformCon as, as well as resources um, on, on the platform engineering blog around kind of the, the product thinking that you need to to have as you go into platform engineering. So I'm not going to talk much about that, but I, I really would encourage you to start thinking about your your editor um, as part of the golden path as people are um, kind of using your platform. And, and it only naturally makes sense, especially if developers are kind of reaching these these friction points where operators are really struggling with with tickets. Um, to, to build in the, the editor there and really think about what is the golden way for people to actually develop and actually code using these, these app templates. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to get into next. So uh, we're, we're in dark mode now. Um, we're, we're getting serious. We don't have a ton of time today. So um, I, I'm going to go through four things and try to link resources uh, on each slide so that you can then go and, and learn more and, and read about each of these, these things separately. Um, first, I'm going to give an overview of the, the landscape of these kind of managed developer environments. Um, share several case studies and, and link out to other ones that you can read and then go over some best practices and stages for actually rolling these out. And this is things that I've really learned over the last couple of years working with with our users and, and, and kind of customers on this. And then and then finally are some some kind of gotchas and then additional resources uh, that, that you should kind of think about as, as you go down this journey. So there, there are several different types of modern developer environments. Um, and, and I did a talk called Modernizing the Developer Runtime, where I go through all three and really talk about the pros and cons of each, what personas really use them, um, and, and where you, you might want to, to focus. Where, where I'm really going to be talking um, about today is, is the remote or the cloud developer environments one on the right. Um, that's what we do at Coder. That's frankly, what, what our products are, are about. Um, and that's what I can kind of speak the most like authoritatively on because I spend a bunch of time thinking about it. But I, I would really encourage you to, to not just jump to one solution and, and really evaluate the different tools for developer environments. Um, on, on to what kind of cloud developer environments or remote developer environments are. Um, the, the, the main thing it, it does from a, a consistency perspective is because it's running on a, on a remote uh, container or on a remote VM, you, you no longer have to think about the underlying hardware developers connecting from. So it doesn't matter if they're on an M1 MacBook or an old Windows machine, because they're all connecting to the same consistent container um, or consistent VM that's running in your in your cloud. Um, 
So th that, that's kind of the, the consistency piece. And it also makes it a lot easier to, to roll out updates and understand what tooling um, engineers are, are using. Um, another benefit of cloud developer environments is developers can get really fast networking and, and, and also just kind of native access to other cloud resources in the network. So for example, if someone's doing an NPM install, for example, that could be from an artifact store that's, that's literally in the same network or in the same cloud as where their environment is. So it's gonna be significantly faster than if they ran it on, on a local machine. Um, and, and the same can be said if you needed to give developers access to like remote data sets, for example, you, you could do that without having to open up a, a like pinhole in, in a firewall and really have to worry about exfiltration because the, the, the developer environment is actually running securely in the cloud as well. Um, and then the third point is for the developer, uh, coding, especially in, in good CDE uh, platforms, um, coding feels local. So I have a screenshot on the, the left here um, where this is my local VS code connected into a remote Linux cloud developer environment. And as I type, it, it's um, the same as if I was typing on my, my local machine, but it, it's being executed on a remote backend and all the source code is also being hosted um, remotely. Whether um, and Another thing to mention here is that the term is cloud developer environments, but um, th these can still run on-prem. Uh, the, the term is coined by Gartner. I, I think it's a good term, but it, it's important, especially if you're building your platform on-prem, for you to have the developer environments in the, in the same place. Um, and I think that naturally kind of goes into where we're going with, with Coder. Um, we're essentially building an open source ecosystem around cloud developer environments. So we have Coder itself, which is a which is the product. Um, it, it's a self-hosted platform for cloud developer environments. So you could run it on-prem, um, you could run it in the cloud. And under Coder, we, we have a number of um, ecosystem projects that you could use in Coder, or you could use if you're building your own platform as well. Um, so you can really kind of choose which components you want to bring in um, as you're rolling out like cloud developer environments. Um, another thing to mention is uh, the way we make money is through an enterprise version. Uh, we, it has features like audit logging, um, high, high availability support, um, and, and, and like more advanced role-based access control. So that's essentially our, our business model. Um, and, and we have a talk where we talk about that later. This is kind of like the last I'm talking about like coder specifically. Uh, so, so on to who actually uses these things. Um, th there's a number of really good blog posts out there talking about why different organizations move to cloud developer environments, the benefits that it brings their developers. Um, well, one of my favorite blog posts is actually Slacks, um, where the, each developer essentially gets access to a, a VM running in a, in a pool. Um, and then I'm also really happy to say that all these ones in purple are all coder um, customers and I get to work with uh, on, on their CDE solution and their rollout. Um, and, and that kind of goes into the, the different stages of rolling out CDEs. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the first two in, in more detail and in the second two, I'm gonna just brush over for the sake of time. Uh, and, and it's really important, I think, to get the, the first two right. And then the rest, um, a little bit further out. Uh, the first is to, and this is kind of a, a, a Docker anti-pattern, but like a CDE best practice, which is interesting, uh, which is to build a single image that has a lot of the tools that um, developers need so that when someone logs in and they create one of these environments, it just works. And this is really a one size fits most. And this is great for internal demos. It's great for hackathon. It's great for... Um, projects that are relatively simple. And it's just a good way to demonstrate kind of the power of CDEs and offer it as a platform and as a carrot for people to hop in and, and start using the, the product. Um, and we've we've worked with organizations with with thousands of developers, and they're actually able to get to about their first like 800 to 1,000 users with this kind of sandbox slash kitchen sink use case. So it's, it's a really kind of simple way uh, to to build out um, just just one or two images that um, can really support a large amount of, of engineers as, as part of your your like IDE path. Um, the the second is allowing teams to bring their own dependencies, and and this is really important. Uh, I'm sure your first thought was, what about the project that needs a specific version of, of Python or or Java? And and that's kind of where the, the dev container spec comes in. Um, it's an open format by Microsoft. 
that lets developers essentially bring their own dependencies. Uh, the, the third is a little bit fancier. It allows teams to bring their own infrastructure, whether that's clusters or, or virtual machines. Um, and, and the fourth is something that CDEs aren't necessarily built for today. Um, it can be done. We, we actually have some users doing it. But this is something that I think in a, in a year or so, A, there will be better support for it. And B, once you kind of have the, the initial user base and the, the business case for what CDEs are really built for, you can start to do the, the fancy stuff. Um, with that, uh, thank you. I wish I had time to, to talk about more, but um, the, the, a few things I'll just mention real quick is that um, we have a blog where we talk about CDEs a lot. Um, we're, we're also at PlatformCon. We, we have a backstage plugin and have started making um, a few other plugins for the ecosystem. So please check that out as well. Um, and this is how you can contact me. Thanks, folks.